And I'm Ben Grauer. For many years, I've been privileged as a radio reporter to sort of sit on the sidelines and describe some of the most amazing and important events of our times. But I've never had an assignment with the curious excitement of this one, introducing the fantastic adventures of the Contiki expedition. The authentic motion pictures, which you're about to see, will take you on an open raft 4,300 miles across the Pacific Ocean and 1,500 years back into history. It's been that long since anybody has made such a voyage and lived to tell about it. Anybody, that is, who risked death as deliberate castaways on the most mysterious part of the map. They've made a film record of what I promise you is an amazing, almost unbelievable adventure. Although not one of them is a professional photographer. Theirs is the kind of film that you and I would make uh, with a home movie camera. They're amateur seamen, too. Landlubbers, like most of us. Thor Heyerdahl, the young Norwegian who organized the expedition, is a zoologist and ethnologist. Ethnology is the science concerned with the origin of the different races of mankind. And like all sciences, it has its mysteries. One of these mysteries surrounds the origin of the people who inhabit Polynesia, people we call South Sea Islanders. Heyerdahl thought he had the probable answer, and he published it. But for 10 years, other scientists would not be convinced. Finally, to solve the mystery to their own satisfaction, six men purposely set themselves adrift on an ocean which, even yet, is not completely chartered. They risked their lives on a flimsy, primitive log raft like this, built without bolts or nails from a design which was already 900 years old when Columbus discovered America. Now, many of you have taken the Contiki voyage through the pages of Heyerdahl's book, have pushed it to the very top of the bestseller class. Now you can actually experience this voyage through this film. But before you see the actual pictures of this astounding adventure, it's only fitting that you hear the story behind it from the leader of the expedition, the man they said would never come back alive, Thor Heyerdahl. Although the Polynesian Islands are located in the part of the Pacific Ocean, which is next to America, it has always been the general opinion that the people first settling these islands came from the Asiatic waters, the cradle of mankind. But in spite of all the research in this area, we can at least say with certainty that the problem has never been solved. During my stay in the Marquesas Islands, large stone statues in the jungle caught my attention. These and other ancient relics reminded me of some of the vanished civilizations of early South America, and I began to speculate as to whether there could have been any connection. Heyerdahl also noticed that the clouds above the islands always moved in one direction, coming in a continuous succession from South America, day and night, month after month, the whole year. Polynesia lies directly in the path of the trade winds, and together with the winds flows a strong and steady ocean current, also from the coast of South America, right into the heart of Polynesia. It was his theory that 900 years before Columbus discovered America, the Pacific Islands might have been settled by people from pre-Inca Peru, that they had deliberately set themselves adrift in the only boats they had, flimsy log rafts. To prove the probability of his theory, Heyerdahl would first have to prove its possibility. So he determined to build an exact duplicate of such a vessel and actually make the journey himself. But this is his story. Let him tell it. It was pointed out that since the Indians did not know the use of spikes or nails, but only lashed their craft together by ropes, these ropes would be chafed off when the logs started to move independently in the ocean, and the entire craft would dissolve. Finally, it was maintained that since the raft only has about a foot or two of freeboard, even the smallest seas would constantly break over 
and in case of a storm, both crew and equipment would be washed overboard. Heyerdahl needed a crew, volunteers, adventurers, unafraid of the sea, and he found them among his fellow Norsemen. Herman Watzinger, a civil engineer from Norway, he supervised the building of the raft based on an accurate description discovered in the musty records of the Spanish conquistadores. Knut Hoagland and Torsten Rabe operated the tiny seven-watt amateur radio transmitter. Both were decorated heroes of the Norwegian underground. Torsten Rabe, from a hidden radio station, sent daily observations on the German battleship Tirpitz for 10 months, reports which resulted in the ship's ultimate destruction. His partner, Knut Hoagland, parachuted behind enemy lines and with his transmitter sabotaged the Nazi heavy water plants, foiling the German efforts to make the atom bomb. Both men were trained to get the utmost distance out of low-powered radio. The only man with any seafaring experience at all was professional artist who shipped as navigator, Eric Hesselberg. I prefer to sit on a raft and use my knife for wood, wood carving and draw because it was so far away from the noisy world and so nice and peaceful out in the ocean. Otherwise, it was my job to get out of position and plot it on a map every day. Bank Danielson, another ethnologist, the expedition steward, and the only Swede among the five Norwegians, was so enthusiastic about the South Sea Islands that he returned before these pictures were assembled. These, then, were the men who were warned that they were inviting certain death, attempting to duplicate a voyage which hadn't been made for 15 centuries. But they were the descendants of Vikings. So their first problem was to get balsa logs big enough to build a raft. Like the early Incas, they intended to cut the balsa timber on the coast of Ecuador. But arriving there, they learned that the old forest had long ago been cut down for commercial export. Only far inland, in the heart of the jungle, could they find big balsa trees today. They were told it was impossible to get in there, as the rainy season had just started and all the roads were flooded or choked with mud. Yet they had to get in, as the expedition members were already assembling in Peru. Heyerdahl's solution was to fly in a small cargo plane with Watzinger over the jungle to the inland city of Quito. Reaching the steamy jungle from its back entrance, they found their giant balsa trees, and with the help of the Indians, they cut down what they needed, stripped the bark off in the native manner, and dragged them to the river. Here they made a temporary raft, loaded it with bamboo and reeds, and with two Indian guides, let the swift current of the river carry them and the logs down through the jungle right to the Pacific coast and from there to the port city of Calao in Peru. From which point, let Thor Heyerdahl tell his own story. The Peruvian authorities became so interested in the expedition that the president himself gave order to open up the closely guarded gates of the naval yard and inside here we were permitted to build our raft with the assistance of the naval crew. Nine big balsa logs were enough to form the entire raft. It was they who should carry us across the ocean. We cut deep grooves around the logs to hold the ropes that were to bind them together. Otherwise, they might slide right off when the logs began to toss and turn in time with the waves at sea. On top of these nine balsa logs, which actually formed the vessel, we bound nine smaller balsa logs crosswise. These widely spaced beams would serve to hold the main logs together and to support the deck, which was a bamboo platform. The bamboo was split lengthwise and part of it was plated to make the deck as tough as possible and yet flexible. The Indian log rafts, like the Eskimo dog sled, were never built with nails. They were lashed together to be flexible and elastic in all joints. The principle of primitive man was not to fight against the nature, but to adapt himself to it. Then the raft was launched. There wasn't a single nail or bolt in the entire construction. Everything was bound together with rope, just as the Indians had done it. 
A little cabin of bamboo lashed together was tied on to the deck. With the pelicans as curious spectators, we bound fast a large block of balsa astern with strong thole pins for the steering oar. The final knots were tied. All in all, there were over 300 of them. Through discoveries in ancient Peruvian graves, we know that the Indians were masters in making excellent ropes of fibers. Then the masts were raised. Like the early raftsmen, we made the masts of very hard mangle wood, which was so heavy that it sank if falling overboard. The boom consisted of two lengths of bamboo lashed together for extra strength. When completed, the raft was towed over to a nearby yacht club where the public and the local authorities could inspect it before departure. A big crowd had assembled, led by the ambassadors from nine different countries. Seamen and landlubbers alike were full of depressive warning. A prominent exporter of balsa wood claimed that the heavily loaded raft would sink long before it was halfway across. The harbor authorities demanded a written statement certifying that they were without responsibility for our departure and a certain naval attaché betted all the whiskey the expedition members could consume for the rest of their lives against the possibility of our safe arrival to Polynesia on the raft. People were quite anxious to collect our autographs. I think they did believe this to be the last chance. After thanking the Peruvian liaison officer for his assistance, the raft was christened Con Tiki with the milk of a coconut. The expedition secretary, Miss Vogue, is rewarded with sunflowers as the raft was named Con Tiki in honor of the sun god of ancient Peru. Inca mythology is full of references to a white and bearded priest king, Con Tiki Viracocha. His head is carved on prehistoric stone statues, and one of these served as model for the head which Hesselberg painted on our sail. The last we are told about Contiki is that he was driven out of his old kingdom, disappearing to the west across the Pacific. Out on the Pacific Islands, the natives too speak of Tiki, who brought their ancestors out to their islands. It was in his trail we should follow with our raft. On April 28, 1947, the pelicans were disturbed by a raft putting to sea the first for many long centuries. A Peruvian naval tugboat towed us out of the harbor and left us clear of the main coastal traffic. Out here, in the early Indian fishing ground, we severed contact with the vessel and returned to the raft in a little rubber dinghy. All film of Contiki in the ocean has been taken from this little dinghy. As we waved farewell to our navy tug, we were left completely isolated, floating on our logs in the ocean. Our nearest goal, the first islands ahead of us, were 4,000 miles behind the horizon. That meant, in the best case, a journey corresponding to the distance from Callao to San Francisco, or from San Francisco to Iceland, or from Iceland to Ethiopia. The very first day, we were caught by the trade winds and also swept along by the Humboldt current with its cold water coming up from the Antarctic. The first few days were a nightmare of struggle. There were nobody living today to give us advance instruction in how to handle an Inca craft. We had to learn through mistakes and experience. Day and night, two men at a time were struggling with the long steering oar in the heavy sea. But gradually we got to know our balsa raft and discovered that if we simply secured the steering oar with rope, the raft would steer itself. 
After this discovery, steering was no longer a major problem as long as the weather remained fairly stable. The steersman's duty was then only to watch the sail and to adjust the lashings on the oar. The steering was divided evenly among us, but there was also a girl on board, and she was excused from such duties. Her name was Lorita, and she was a South American parrot. Lorita was seasick for four days, and so was one of the boys, but both recovered and became perfect sailors. It doesn't matter if the sea breaks in, as long as the boat is leaking the bottom, so the water runs out again. The advantage with a raft is that the water runs out just as fast as it comes in. If we did not keep the stern properly in the wind, the raft would swing around in such a way that the sea would break over the side and straight into the open bamboo hut. But as long as we kept the sails filled with wind, we could ride along with the waves like a seabird. If we were not alert when the wind swung around, then the sail would be filled from the side. We would have to row with the heavy steering oar and fight with the sail until it was filled from the aft. Otherwise it would be torn against the bamboo hut or sweep the cargo overboard. In the daytime, we were all on hand to assist with the heavy oar, but at night it was easy for the lonely watch to be swept overboard by the sail in heavy sea, and there were no fence around the slippery logs. Behind the raft, we had nearly always a patient company of sharks. In the end, Contiki always gave in and proceeded good-naturedly with the wind at her back. The raft never attempted to move in the direction of South America. If she turned around, it was only to proceed stern first in the direction of the Polynesian island. Not once did we observe a gust of wind that favored a drift the opposite way. It blew constantly in the same direction as the current went. This is the way we used to determine our surface speed. One man sits in the bow and tosses out a piece of balsa. And another man sits astern with his watch to take the time when the piece of wood floats past. We know exactly how long the raft is, and so it is an easy matter to figure out our speed. Hesselberg at noon fixes the height of the sand with his sextant so that we can plot the approximate daily drift on our map. From the top of the mast, we looked down on the starboard side where the cabin wall was open and where we spent most of the time. Here we had a galley, a wooden case with a primus dove at the bottom. In this we prepared our food in a kind of white man's style. We were not to prove that we ourselves were prehistoric Indians. We were to test the balsa raft and its capacity. It happened more than once that the wooden case and even part of the bamboo wall caught fire. But fortunately we never had far to go for water, so we could quickly put a fire out. If we got tired of looking at each other at close range, we generally went out in the rubber boat and observed each other from greater distance. The first time we ventured in the dinghy, we were so fascinated by the way we looked from a distance that we completely forgot the problem we might have in getting back to the raft. We soon realized that Contiki moved faster than we thought and we could not catch up with her in the big swells with the dancing dinghy. The men on board Contiki could not arrest her drift and still less turn around and come back again. Even when they hauled down the sail, the raft moved so rapidly that we were completely exhausted when we came near enough for the men on board to throw out a piece of rope. From that day it was strictly forbidden to row out in the rubber boat unless a line was fastened to the raft. It would be no pleasure to be left behind in the middle of the ocean with thousands of miles to the nearest shore. During the entire voyage 
we did not see a single ship nor any other sign to indicate that there existed any other humans in the world. The parrot gradually developed into a real seabird. If it got chilly, Lorita kept warm by performing acrobatics in the gay roads. She hated to waste her time in the cave. Antiki was far out on the ocean. The Humboldt current swept us near the equator, then pushed us directly out across the Pacific. The southeasterly trade winds changed direction and blew due west parallel with the current. The ocean current accounted for about one third of our progress, the rest was caused by the trade winds. An ordinary sunny day out at sea was extremely quiet and restful. Often the ocean could be so calm and the wind so steady that we could let the raft manage itself completely. On such days, we felt that we were in a sort of a never-never land. With nobody at the helm, the steering oar bobbed peacefully up and down in the way, none of us needed to be on watch. We didn't even bother angling. Delicious flying fish presented themselves on deck, ready to enter the frying pan. The cook's first duty in the morning was to pick up the frying pan and go around on deck picking up all the flying fishes which had flown on board during the night. It was an excellent breakfast. When a flying fish lands on deck, it is completely helpless. Actually, a flying fish cannot really fly, it glides. By swimming up through the water at high speed, it cuts the surface and can then glide through the air for a few hundred yards before falling down, as in this case on the deck of Contiki. One dark night, this peculiar fish slithered right into Robi's sleeping bag, where its fang-like teeth made it a rather unpopular arrival. Later on, we appreciated this visitor more when we learned that it was a fish never before seen by man. Two such snake mackerel, or gempilus, jumped right on board voluntarily at night, so it seems practical to travel on prehistoric craft if one wants to collect strange fishes in the 20th century. Once a fortnight, we took up the bamboo deck to inspect the ropes and to get at various equipment we were testing for the American Quartermaster General. This was primarily a new type of rations which had been produced in the laboratories but had not yet been tried out under actual conditions. We had nuts, roots and other vegetables in baskets tied onto the deck but this special ration was placed under the deck down in the water between the logs. When we open the deck, it is possible to see how the raft is lashed together. On top are the flexible bamboo mats, then solid lengths of split bamboo tied to frames, which were easily unfastened and lifted out. It was a difficult task to keep the water out of the boxes down here, but Watzinger covered the cardboard containers with a thin coat of soft asphalt, held in sand, not to be sticky and break apart. When the deck is open, a glimpse of one of the raft's five centerboards can be seen. The centerboard was invented long before it was known to us by the prehistoric Indians of Peru. It is a piece of board inserted vertically in the cracks between the logs, intended to give the shallow raft a straight course and not a helpless sideways drift.
Watzinger opens up one of the asphalted boxes to check the content. As part of the testings for the quartermaster, two of the crew had volunteered to refrain from eating fresh fish, plankton, or the vegetable diet we carried on deck, and yet they were as healthy as the rest of us at the end of the voyage, so the ration must have been good. Lorita prefers the contents of the basket she is sitting on, coconuts. We had 200 coconuts along. Tests and measurements are made to make a detailed report possible when we return to civilization. The ancient voyagers did not live on the quartermaster's rations. They had their own natural supply. What they didn't carry with them on the raft was provided for by the inexhaustible supplies furnished by the sea. The discovery of the abundant fish supply was of the greatest importance to my theory since all experts had asserted that the lack of fresh food supply at sea would not allow primitive raftsmen from Peru to survive the enduring journey across the open ocean. There are no fish out in the middle of the oceans, it was said. You will only find fish in the coastal currents next to shore. It may be true that no fish are seen if one travels with modern craft with the speed and the noise from the propeller make them dive. But if one glides silently with the waves on a flat-bottomed raft, then the fish appear and even seek refuge beneath the raft. Most common was the dolphin, or dorado, a tropical fish not to be confused with the delphin, which is a small-toothed whale. The dolphin was delicious food and if we wanted fresh fish for supper, all we had to do was to tell the cook 20 minutes in advance, and it was his duty to pull in the meal. The simplest method was to stick a pole with a hook on the end down into the water, and then pull up the fish by the tail. The dolphin has sharp teeth, and he who climbs up on the case knows it, he has once had his big toe well inside the mouth of one of them. Raw fish is not only a source of food, but also of drink. When we pulled up big fish like these, we experimented by cutting a large hole in the side of the fish. The hole slowly filled with liquid from the fish's lymph gland and although I wouldn't precisely say it was delicious, it is quite drinkable in emergency, and the very low content of salt makes it absolutely thirst-quenching. It is quite obvious that primitive people from South America would be able to sustain their lives on a journey through these waters, even if trapped on an accidental drift without adequate provisions on board. The Peruvian raftsmen carried their water supply in giant calabashes lashed to the deck, and often in special watertight baskets. We had with us a ton of water, which was more than sufficient for the entire journey, and furthermore, after the first few weeks we entered an area where we could collect sufficient rainwater to keep us going from day to day. On hot days, when the pores of the skin released enough salt, we mixed seawater into the drinking water. At such hot days, following an advice by the Royal Air Force, we drank up to 40% seawater with 60% fresh water, without harmful after effects. Parasites were collected from the fish we caught. The sea was filled with even smaller organisms which we consumed, namely plankton. 
Plankton is a myriad of very tiny animals and plants which float about near the surface of the sea. As they are practically invisible to the naked eye, we had to collect them in a very fine mesh net which we simply dragged behind the raft. When the net was filled, it looked like a many-colored paste and tasted like caviar, clams or shrimp paste. Small jellyfish and other intruders had to be removed. Plankton must be rich in food content, since it is the staple diet of the largest whales. Here the lookout at the top of the mast has discovered something huge coming out of the sea. A whale! We were frequently visited by these puffing giants, and the first time when we suddenly found us surrounded, we certainly got a little excited. At the beginning they were quite a ways off, but as soon as they spotted the raft, they headed directly for us. From the top of the mast, the lookout could tell us that the biggest were larger than the raft, and we feared a possible collision as they approached us like puffing locomotives. It isn't as easy to stop the whale as it is to stop the film. There are many tons in such a heaving colossus, and it gave us an uneasy feeling to stare right down into its tiny blowhole. But the whales always submerged just before colliding with the raft, and then they would glide smoothly by under our floor. Sometimes we could stand on the edge of the log and looked down at the wide black back of a whale lying almost motionless in the clear water just beneath us. We knew that whales in the Antarctic have attacked small craft and crushed them with their enormous strength, but they left us in peace. Time and again they would come heading right in at Kontiki, but at the last instant they dove below us. When the whales had tired of playing around the raft, they disappeared again in the depth as mysteriously as they had arrived. After a visit by the whales, we were generally anxious to inspect the ropes. It did happen that some of them broke, but never because of the whales. The rope to the steering oar snapped frequently, and it was a steady job to keep it repaired. The slimy seaweed had made the logs in the aft as slippery as ice, and if anyone slipped, he knew he would find unpleasant company in the water behind us. During the day, there were plenty of ready hands available, but at night the steersman was alone and had to be lashed to the raft by rope. At intervals, we cleared the deck to inspect all the lashings. We had with us a little extra rope, but not enough to do us much good if the raft started to dissolve through continued friction between logs and lashings. But again the authorities were mistaken when they predicted the ropes to be gnawed off, and we discovered the interesting reason. The balls of wood was too soft to cut the ropes. The ropes were harder than the wood of the raft, and grooved their way slowly into the soft and wet tree trunks. 